This week on the GCN Racing News Show, some huge news for us as we launch our biggest and most ambitious project yet, GCN Plus. We've also got the Cyclocross World Championships from Belgium, the first big road race of the year in Europe with the Grand Prix Marseillaise, EF Education Nippos 2021 kit, and we've partnered up with the Tour of Britain and Women's Tour, a partnership which will mean the Women's Tour will be televised live for the very first time. This week in the world of racing, we learnt that the Dutch are the kings and queens of cyclocross. Uh, there were four rainbow jerseys on offer in Ostende in Belgium over the weekend, and they hopped back over the border into Holland with all four of them. More on the World Championships with Marty and Jeremy later on. We also learnt that pro racing in Europe is back. Yeah. And there is Kokar centre line at the moment, Trenton to the left hand side of your screen. They're opening up on the barriers. Brian Kokar tries to dig again. Oh, it's going to be tied to the line to three up, I think. Yes. Uh, it feels like it's been a long time coming, doesn't it? But actually, yesterday's Grand Prix Marseillaise came less than three months after the end of La Vuelta. But wasn't it great to see the peloton rolling along once again? And finally this week, you are about to learn that GCN is about to become better than ever. This is everything I've built towards. I'm a little bit crazy. Never seen anything quite like this. Out of breath, high heart rate. We only get one shot. God, come on! I'm really feeling the altitude now. Ah. Oh. There were shades of 89, Le Mans Fignon, but this was something else. 3D printing is taking the world by storm. It was an amazing time. I met amazing people. Hello and welcome to the world of cycling. I wanted to do the impossible challenge. Look at this. gold mine of carbon fibre. The mountain takes no prisoners. Through the sprint, the throw to the line. Welcome everybody to GCN Plus, the biggest and best thing that we have ever done. So GCN Plus is more of everything you've come to love from GCN, but taken to the next level. More entertainment, more races, more inspiration, more access, more analysis, more science, and more to watch, basically. So from today, the best place to watch live racing, plus new exclusive and original films and documentaries, is GCN Plus, all year round, all in one place, all ad free. So as of today, Race Pass will become part of GCN Plus. With it, you are going to get everything we offered you last year, so live racing, highlights, analysis, and weekly shows. But on top of all of that, we will now be giving you a whole range of exclusive long-form cycling films and documentaries. So we've got a whole heap of them landing on the app on the 15th of February, and there'll be more added each and every week from the 1st of March. Behind the scenes, over the past year and a half, we have been filming some truly epic stuff, including scaling the world's highest volcano, the latest science and tech, and delving into the history of cycling. So all aspects of cycling are covered, but since you're currently watching the Racing News Show, it's probably the racing related films that you're going to be most interested in. And we've definitely got your back covered there. So we're gonna have the definitive story of the COVID hit 2020 season, which features many of cycling's main players. I've also been out to see the likes of Fabian Cancellara, Andre Taffy, Andy Schleck, and many more, which you'll be able to watch in our Legend of Cycling series. And they were a lot of fun to make, I have to say, except for the cross country skiing with Fabian. I have come to Andermatt in Switzerland to meet. To meet. No. Whoa! Like Bambi on ice was how one onlooker described that. Uh, anyway, as I said, we have been working flat out on this for well over a year, and I have to say we are all extremely proud of what we've managed to achieve and cannot wait to show everyone out there. Now, there's a lot of good news about GCN Plus. Firstly, 
If you are a current Race Pass subscriber, you will automatically become a GCN Plus subscriber, which means you'll get access to all the racing content that's available in your country, plus all the documentaries which are available in every territory. And on top of that, if you are not currently a Race Pass subscriber, the price to subscribe is not only remaining exactly the same as last year, despite all the extra content, but we've got a special launch offer for you throughout February, which is 50% off the usual price. So 20 pounds, 20 euros, or 25 dollars for the whole year. Now that's less than two euros a month, or 38 pence a week, less than seven cents a day, and that is for all the racing and all the documentaries. I mean, I know I'm trying to sell this to you here, but that's a bloody bargain, isn't it? Uh, in all seriousness, we would absolutely love your support in this because we wouldn't be here eight years after we started with GCN without you, our lovely viewers. You have allowed us to grow, to make continually better content, to get racing rights, and now to make films and documentaries. But we won't be able to keep doing that without your support. All of our content, as I mentioned on the app, is ad-free, it's uninterrupted, it's year-round. There won't be a single week where we don't have new content for you. So that special price is available for the whole of February, but come March the 1st, it will return to full price, which is £6.99 a month, or £40, or €40 Euros a year. So don't miss out on this one. There is a link on screen right now to the subscription page, and we're also going to put a link to this in the description just below this video. Now, on Wednesday, you will have the first World of Cycling show for 2021 with Adam Blythe as our special guest and then the first documentaries land on 15th of February and fingers crossed we'll have live racing for you this month too. Speaking of which uh, let's get back to racing shall we? I'm going to hand over now to Jeremy and Marty to talk you through the action from the weekend's UCI World Cyclocross Championships. Thank you so much, Dan. This weekend, Dan's right. It was the big finale of the proper cyclocross season, the 2021 World Championships from Ostenda, Belgium, the home of cyclocross. And again, just like last weekend, I've got my commentator and good friend, Marty McDonald, with me this weekend to talk about the races. Marty, we saw some fantastic racing all weekend. On Saturday, it was the men's under 23 and the women's elite races. Yeah, what can we say about that? Going into the... Uh under 23 men there was a lot of names up there and we don't get to see the under 23 men race against their peers very often so this one was you're trying to look through the last world cups because the last championships we had was the europeans we only had one world cup this winter as well but it really was a great race on a great course and, and we saw Pim Ronha swooping his way into the finish. An outgoing champion, Ryan Camp. Great defense. He came back from quite a few tumbles and little errors to fight back ultimately to that silver medal. And uh, for Belgium, it was a bronze with Timo Kielek. But the elite women's race, what a battle that we had in that one. And and, and you know, as, a, as, a, as an ex-pro, the, the difference between being consistent week in, week out, and then peaking for that big day. And there was a lot of pressure on Lucinda Brand going into this one. Celine Del Carmen Alvarado had great form and unfortunately we saw her just go down on that pretty much the first corner and Sana Camp was also delayed and then we saw Denise Betzema that tactic that we've seen her try time and time again sometimes it works sometimes it didn't this time it was her, her two teammates in Anna Reverse and Lucinda Brand that got back to the front they then got through and we had that epic battle and we've got to say that Anna Reverse looking at her. She had a victory back in Copperberg right back at the beginning of the season, but she is looking, as her career goes on, she's looking very much like a championship rider and set things up. That, that battle backwards and forwards between her and Lucinda Brand on that final lap was something to behold. Yeah, I think Anna Marie Verst is the World Championships rider of the last couple of years. If you look back at her Under-23 World Championship where she did battle with Evie Richards and Ellen Noble to take her first title there, and then you look at last year with Celine Del Carmen Alvarado with that sprint finish when they came down the finishing shoot. I mean, to, then you look at this race where she went just past Lucinda Brown in that last minute of the race to almost take the victory away from really the most dominant rider in recent history on the women's side. She's just absolutely on fire. She looked really, really focused at the start. She wanted to take a big day out and she wanted to put down a big effort. She did, came up just a little bit short, but um, I, I think she had said in her post-race interview, this second place to Lucinda Braun felt a little bit uh, easier to take than last year's to say Lindell Carmen Alvarado. So yeah, it's a uh, it, it's definitely a little bit of a heartbreak for, for Anna Marie Verst fans, but in the end, Marty, it's a, a very deserving winner in Lucinda Braun, isn't it? 
Yeah, indeed. And it's, it was quite amazing when you uh, saw afterwards how quickly they had that world champions uh, Trek bike ready for her as well. The, the team are always super prepared for that one. But we, we kicked off Sunday, didn't we, with the under 23 women. And that was a really, again, we were, we were really excited to see that because we don't get to see them racing against their peers very often. No, we don't. We don't. I mean, again, just like the uh, under 23 men's races, especially this year with the pandemic, the under 23 women's races have really been embedded into the elite women's races. And we've had to look down through the results to find those riders. Sheeran Van Androy, Puck Petersa, Menon Backer, uh, Anik Van Alpha, Fem Van Empel, all of these riders, names that were sticking out into the top 10, sometimes on, on the podium even with Manon Backer coming up really, for, really on form as she got ready. So there were a lot of names but one of the most exciting battles i think that we were looking forward to this weekend and it was a it was a race to watch wasn't it it was and it was inga van der heide the uh, former world champion in, as an under 23 one of two that were on the start with outgoing champion maria norbert ribarola she got the front and then that chasing group behind blanca katavash from hungary the only non-dutch rider really that made that that front group and with fem van empel very new to the sport, 18 years old, and she's had some great performances this winter. And Annick van Alfa as well. And, and you could see that Blanca Katavash from Hungary was having to be very, very sensible in her riding. And then it did. It came down to that sand section again along the beach. And we saw during the race, didn't we, in tactically going into that final lap, Blanca Katavash had gone very, very fast far up the beach before she turned right. Whereas we saw the Dutch riders running, sort of cutting a, a path across the sand. And, it, and we, right in commentary, we said, will Blanca Vash do the same as previous laps or try to stay with the Dutch riders on the run? And ultimately it was that run that won Fem van Empel the title. She was able to uh, keep that gap and then end up riding away with her first world championship title for that very, very young up and coming rider. It's very exciting to be able to see her do so well at the Urban Cross and Kortrijk and then come back and really double down and take that world championship title away from riders that are even a couple of years older than her already. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And she's got a massive career ahead of her and a, and a real signing for Pau Sals and Bingo as well for the, for the future. But then, then we had the, the elite men in the afternoon and, and it really finished it off. And we have this massive presence in cyclocross, don't we? And in world cycling now, and these battles between Wout van Aert and Matthew van der Poel, and they're up there, I think, now with some of the, the biggest battles in, in sport. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think back of all the great battles that we've had, whether it was Lars Boom and uh, Sven Nace, or it was Sven Nace and Zednik Stebar, or even more recently, Niels Albert and Sven Nace. I mean, you know, you, you look at these these rivalries that build up over the cyclocross season, but the one with Wout Van Aert and Matthew Van Der Poel is really year round, whether it's on the road or it's in cyclocross. These two riders, every time they line up, Marty, they want to beat the other one up badly. And today was no different. Wout Van Aert took the playbook from last week in Ostenda where he, uh, excuse me, in Overeisset where he had had that success. He comes out, wins on Overeisset, then comes out today, tries to use the exact same play, goes 100% from the gun, tries to snap the rubber band of Matthew Vanderpoel, then everything went from there. Tell us about what happened in the rest of it. But as Wout Van Aert managed to get that small gap in the beginning, he was starting to force those little errors from Matthew Van Aert. We saw him just sliding out a little bit. Then he got caught in a rut, which flipped him over the handlebars. And you, it looked at that point like Wout Van Aert was going to start riding away to the title. But then Van Der Poel came back quickly. Wout Van Aert, again, the experience showed of him. He played it very cagey and very calm. And it became evident that he had a front wheel puncture and he managed to stay in front for as long as possible uh, he got the bike change but it wasn't quick enough and the, and the gap there it was only eight seconds but then eight seconds to Matthew Van Der Poel, who's stringing together these corner after corner where he's taking half a second here one second there and that was ultimately the the, the gap really when Wout Van Aert came out of the pits would you say that was the cl as close as he got and then the errors started to go the other way after the flat tire, I think that really messed up Wout Van Aert's momentum and his uh, and the way that he was thinking about the race mentally. He had that problem, and then he was already at the top of his limit. Then you saw Wout Van Aert start to have problems in the sand, very very small ones. But at this level, Marty, even a small problem really does start to add up. And I think that that's like Matthew Vanderpool said in the post-race interview. That's where things really started to turn around for him. For me. 
ride of the weekend, I've, I've got to say Lucinda Brand. There's so much pressure and expectation going in, going into that one. Yeah, definitely. In fact, Marty, we had a uh, we had a very interesting wager here on the uh, <clears throat> on the predictions of this race, and I have to say that uh, with my competitive background, having been a pro, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this because, um, well, I I did quite well to be honest with you. And we had a little bit of a wager actually um, going about uh, about this, and I I believe that uh, I believe that you're going to have to come true on it. A bet's a bet. I lost three one to you, but you got to hold up your end of the bargain. I mean, I couldn't leave you hanging. And in the end, it's all good fun, Marty. I know I called the, the three of the winners of the race, but you did get one with Lucinda Braun. So good to you. All right. Well, that's all we've got from Men's Hair International. Back over to you, Dan. Great stuff. Thank you very much both. Uh, so a first title for Brunt and a fourth for Vanderpool. Nobody, actually, apart from Vanderpool or Van Aert, has won the Elite Men's World title since Denek Stebar won it in 2014, seven years ago, and yet both of them are only 26 years old. I mean, such is their dominance in this discipline that if you hadn't been paying attention, you'd have thought that Tone Arts had become world champion when he crossed the line. To come third to those two is like a win in itself. And what was particularly interesting was looking at which parts of the course favoured each rider. So Velofax broke it down into the key sections and it appears that Van Aert was fastest on the beach, Pidcock was actually fastest on the steep bridges and the technical sectors, but Van der Poel got most of his advantage on what they described as the easiest sections of the course. Very technical start of the cross, isn't it? You can see why types of course make such a big difference to the types of rider it suits. Right, let's move on to some road racing now, shall we? I must say, I was a little bit pessimistic as to whether or not we'd get any big races at all in Europe in February, but I was very pleased to be proven wrong yesterday as the Grand Prix Marseilles was run successfully with live coverage for the first time ever. So I hope you enjoyed it if you watched that over on Race Pass. It was probably one of the most competitive editions ever too. I have a feeling this season is going to be very much race like last year's with everyone going flat out at every single event because no one really knows which races will or won't go ahead. That was certainly the case for the winner of the race yesterday, the young Frenchman Aurelien Paripant of Age 2 r Citroën. Uh, the 24-year-old was on the attack in the closing stages of the race, but somehow still managed to find the strength and the power to win the sprint to the line. Uh, there he got the better of Thomas Boudin and Brian Coquart, which made it an all-French podium. And that was actually the first ever pro win for Paripant, and another reminder of just how important timing is when it comes to sprinting. Now, talking about races that are being televised live for the very first time, let's now move on to that other bit of really exciting news for us, because we, Eurosport and GCN, have just partnered up with the Tour of Britain and Women's Tour. It's a five-year partnership that will see the Women's Tour covered live for the very first time in its history, which is fantastic news, I'm sure you'll agree. And it won't just be the live racing, we'll have other features and analysis around that racing to take you behind the scenes and in amongst the action. Now, along with the Women's Tour and the Tour of Britain, it'll also mean we'll be showing the Tour series in most territories around the world. So even more for your GCN Plus subscription money. Happy days. Uh, we're delighted about this. It's like the best Monday ever at the moment. Now, here's hoping that all racing goes ahead as planned, though. Uh, February isn't looking too good right now, although as things stand, the French races do look set to go ahead as planned. Uh, so this week, it is the Etoile de Bessege, and then there's the Tour de la Provence and the Haute-Var after that. But unfortunately, things haven't been so good over in Spain. So off the back of the postponement of the Ruta del Sol, both the men's and the women's Bolta Balenciana's were postponed last week, which leaves us with the single day Classica de Almeria as things stand in Spain. The better news is that we also have coverage though this month of the Australian Criterium and Road Race Championships, and that's to look forward to on GCN Plus, as well as the UAE Tour and the remaining cyclocross races to finish off that season. So all is not completely lost. Speaking of the UAE Tour, we can now see the route for that seven-day race. There are four stages for the sprinters, two for the climbers, and one individual time trial which has Filippo Ganna's name written all over it. Uh, so those sprinter stages come on days one, four, six and seven in Al Murfa, Al Marian, Palm Jumeirah and downtown Abu Dhabi respectively. Uh, it's stage two that will see the first gaps amongst the GC contenders though, being a 13 km pan flat individual time trial around Al Hudrayat Island, which will probably take Ghana in the region of 13 minutes to complete. 
Uh, stages three and five, meanwhile, are for the climbers. So the first of those finishes on the classic Jebel Hafit climb, which was used twice last year and won by Adam Yates and Tadej Pogacar, respectively, uh, both of whom, in fact, will be amongst the favourites this year. And then stage five is another climb that has been used before, the Jebel Jais, which was last used in 2019 when Primoz Roglic took the win. Uh, Roglic will not be in attendance this year. He starts his season at Paris-Nice, but he is one of the few stars who isn't going to be at the UAE Tour. Because beyond Yates and Pogacar, we have Froome, Ackerman, Gaviria, Van der Poel, Ewan and Kuss, who are all set to take part. And in the absence of Roglic, maybe Kuss isn't a bad bet for the overall win if he's on form. We'll see how he does in the time trial. Moving on, uh, one of the best bits of news I saw last week was from Trek Segafredo, who have made their women's team base salary the same as the men's, even though they aren't obliged to do so under UCI regulations. So speaking to Cycling News, the team said that the riders, regardless of gender, will receive at least the minimum wage stipulated, stipulated should I say, by the UCI for male riders, and that is €40,000 for employed or €65,000 for self-employed, both of which are just over twice as much as the minimum wages for women's World Tour teams. So hats off to Trek Segafredo. I mean, that is how it should be, obviously. They are doing it right, and I'm sure others will soon follow suit. Meanwhile, as you desire Citron's Belgian classic stars Oliver Nassen and Greg van Avermaet have been hitting the cobbles of northern France, uh, testing their new BMC machines in readiness for Paris-Roubaix this spring. And I have to say, it looks like they had a pretty grim day out for it. Uh, great to see some cobbles though, isn't it? And those bikes do look great. Some new kit of a different kind now though, as EF Education Nippo finally revealed their 2021 look with Rafa. Uh, no more ducks. They've been back to their predominantly pink jersey with some subtle differences versus 2020, including a different colour for the sponsor logos and discrete measurements on there as well uh, of those logos, which shows the UCI that they're complying with their rules. So hopefully they won't get any more fines this year. Now this is another kit that is very much a hot from me, even though I don't think I'd make it look hot myself. Uh, but anyway, as ever, you can give us your opinion over on the GTIN app. New EF Education Nippo kit, hot or not? Uh, now, last week's poll was of Canyon SRAM's 2021 kit, and rather unsurprisingly, most of you love it, with 84% voting hot, putting it at the top of the World Tour table, equal with SD Works. So let's see if EF can top them, or whether the women's World Tour teams will rule the roost. I'll let you know next week. Right, that is all for this week's GCN Racing News Show. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you again next Monday, but don't forget to subscribe to GCN Plus. It's a bargain. Bye.